aspect, there's nothing that makes an academic so tense <laughs> as not having a PowerPoint. <laughs> We planned this pl panel discussion in a very conversational talk show host type style where we'd like to go informal, almost cold and explore issues that were said so far in the audience and with a keynote and with the various welcome addresses. I am joined on stage by three wonderful colleagues of mine, two of whom I know very well. I would like to start with Asha Kanwa. She's the president and the chief executive officer of the Commonwealth of Learning since 2012. But what I find peculiar about her history, and I will not go back very far, <laughs> is that she started her engagement with business education already in 1988 at the Indira Gandhi National Open University as a reader. Asher, thank you very much for joining us. Then I turn to Alan Tate on my right. Uh, he's currently the Director of International Development and Teacher Education at the Open University of the United Kingdom. He published extensively in the field of business education. And what I personally know about student support, Alan, and about distance education, I learned from Alan. So it's an amazing honor for me to have him next to me and share the stage with him. Then on my far right is Tolim Buete. This morning when he arrived, he gave me four folios, four A4s of his updated CV. <laughs> and I <laughs> said to him, Tolim, I'm going to read two sentences. And he was fairly taken aback. <laughs> but Tuli, uh, allow me just then to introduce you in following the president I said with Asher and with Alan. He's the immediate past president of the Amer African Council for Distance Education. He has conducted research in the areas of environmental engineering, ICT, institutional reforms, and environmental management. So that's the introduction. Can we give them a hand for joining me? Thank you. I would like to know from you, from your respective contexts, what is currently happening out there, Asha? Before we turn to the welcome addresses and into some of the issues that Tracy raised, what is currently happening out there from your respective role and context and insights. I know it's, it's a frightening question, it can be brought and you can speak for as long as you like, but I would like to just, just think for a moment what is currently happening in the field of distance open and e-learning worldwide from your perspective and what is not happening and possibly why? What is happening there? So Tolly, I'm, I'm scared to ask who will go first. <laughs> um, Asha, would you like to start, and then you can always, well, this will be a conversation, so would you like this to start to say what is happening, what is not happening, and possibly why we don't see it happening? Asha. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for taking me on first. I'll <laughs> pay you back at another time. <laughs> but um, I think from my point of view, two very important um, developments are taking place, which are actually happening, uh, having a very major impact of... Uh, on distance and online provision. Uh, one is, of course, OER, and the other is MOOCs. And it's interesting that distance learning institutions haven't taken leadership roles in either of these two movements. Mm. They are just now beginning to wake up you know, to these two developments. And these have very major implications. For example, with OER, you know, Distance learning institutions always prided themselves on their family silver, which was the course content, mm. which was very high quality and reputations were built on that. Now the rug has been pulled under the feet of mm -hmm. our institutions because OER is coming as free content. So what are we going to do about it? We haven't really uh, actually overcome the credibility gap that exists between distance and contact institutions. So are we going to invest more 
in learner support, which has always been a weak spot in many developing countries, as we see in many Commonwealth countries, you know, there's a huge expansion in distance learning. But the reason that the credibility crisis still exists is to a large extent based on learner support. Okay. So that's one. The other important thing is MOOCs. Uh, Again, MOOCs, you know, we have all the experience as distance educators on running quality MOOCs. But we haven't really sort of, you know, um, seized the day in that respect. And we're just trying to look around to see, you know, what to do and how to follow. Uh, one of the things which MOOCs would allow us actually is to make the world a classroom. Um, the, the other thing is to do something which we really haven't done as distance educators, which is more emphasis on peer-to-peer. -peer. It's been more teacher, student, content, content, content student, rather than, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. So those are very exciting opportunities. Learning analytics is an exciting opportunity to build the quality. We haven't really done that, and which is what my organization, in fact, is trying to do is, uh, in order not to expand the digital divide or the Quality gap, uh, equality gap. We are trying to promote MOOCs for development. So that if somebody wants to take a MOOC in Sierra Leone, we try to make it into a blended approach. And we did offer a MOOC on mobiles for development. And people who were taking it in Sierra Leone wanted, you know, all the material on CD-ROM to be sent it to them so that they could use their limited uh, connectivity for interaction with the tutors or with the peers, peers, so that's one. Uh, so we are trying to sort of offer, you know, MOOCs in India, we offered them to gardeners using a basic mobile interface and used call centers. Wow. So I think two things which we'll have to look at is the technology issue when we offer and expand access without increasing inequality. Mm -hmm. One would be the kind of appropriate, available and affordable technologies. And the second, to build on our experience as distance educators, uh, to use more blended approaches, mm. which actually speak to the constituencies that we deal with. Wow, I, I actually wanted to go to Alan and Tolly in Pueti, but Tolly, can I put you on the spot um, from something that Ashwa said? She said, the value contribution of distance education was always our content how we got our content to our students in whatever format. Now, open educational resources is changing that. Our value contribution is changing. So, so where does our value contribution lie? Would you like to respond to that, Tolly? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank Asha for the comment she has raised. Uh, first of all, the one major development that is taking place uh, all over the world, be it in uh, Africa or in other developing countries or in the developed world, is that uh, the final distinction between the so-called residential universities and the open and distance learning universities is slowly dying away because uh, increasingly uh, all of us uh, are finding ourselves uh, evolving to use some sort of blended learning whether, whether you are intense in, in, uh, in e-learning than the residential mode, all of us are moving towards blended learning. So that historical idea of thinking an open university, uh, an audio university, is very different from a virtual university, is, is dying away. Secondly, the, the challenges that have been uh, ushered upon the universities through they recently adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And also for us who are in Africa, the Agenda 2063 uh, declared by the African Union Commission give the universities, and in particular the Open Distance Learning Universities, an added challenge of being able to go well beyond the normal course of duty of uh, simply teaching students. I think the Open Distance Learning Universities will have to play a very active role as also said by uh, the keynote speaker, in being able to participate in educating the entire communities. And I'm saying this because uh, increasingly we are seeing the importance of our respective nations supporting the open distance learning uh, institutions.
by making sure availability of uh, a, a high quality uh, ba bandwidth. I stress on quality because some governments in Africa have invested in increased bandwidth, but the, the quality of services offered by the internet service providers until now is a major challenge to the universities that no matter what you do, no matter what facilities you put up, the, the quality of the services that is available within, within our countries is bad. So the universities here are challenged to work with their governments to make sure the services that's available uh, within the countries is, is, is good. And I'm saying this because uh, I'll give a, a live example here. Um, in my recent role as the president of the Pan-African University Council, we visited one African country which is uh, targeted to become the headquarters of the Pan-African University. So during the course of our visit, we found the host government has prepared itself very well. But one area of course, we are not very sure of, and it requires a confirmation by experts, is engagement with uh, the quality of the uh, bandwidth uh, that's available in the country would be good enough to save the headquarters of the Pan-African University which is supposed to be a model university in delivery of education. So without working closely with the uh, host governments, it means that the Pan-African University will, will, may not succeed to achieve uh, good delivery. So again here, partnership in delivery of education is, is very much uh, an issue now. Thanks, thanks for that, but I, I, I'm still worried that we haven't addressed the issue now. Suddenly we have all the bandwidth that we can use. What are we going to do with it, Tolly? If we thought content is our value contribution and now suddenly we have bandwidth, but content is no longer more our, our value contribution. Alan, what will we do? S suddenly the world changes and we have bandwidth and someone else has the content. What is our value contribution? Um, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for putting us all on the spot. You may not know, colleagues, <laughs> that we all came along with short talks to give. <laughs> and, and Paul has completely turned the tables on us. <laughs> and we're <laughs> so we're, we're responding now in this very, very, very um, um, spontaneous way. Um, I think it is a fascinating change which Asha has identified. And I also um, am reflecting very hard on some of the issues that, that Tracy, Cotton, Tracy McMillan Cotton raised. And I think I would put it this way, Paul. Um, what I'm reflecting on are accounts of excellence and accounts of openness. And I think we need to reflect a lot more deeply on those. Accounts of excellence in education are dominated by discourse of selection. The most excellent universities are those which are most selective. Mm. This is not our world, but we find it very difficult to challenge that discourse of excellence. If I, for example, think of the university in the city where I live, which is Cambridge in England, they have something like 2% dropout per year. That is not the sort of t statistic we have in my university, the Open University UK. Our dropout, uh, which Minister Nzimande um, highlighted as, sig as a significant question, our dropout in my university in the UK is much, much higher. Because our excellence is not about selectiveness. My university does not select its students. Students select us. And generally speaking, our students come, as Tracy so eloquently um, uh, told us this morning, uh, from behind. We come from fractured pathways into education, from marginalized communities, uh, from places in our society uh, which are the more difficult ones to make progress from. So while we have to pay attention to dropout, I don't think we should be intimidated by the fact that our discourse of excellence is about inclusion. It's a completely different discourse of excellence from that which still dominates our higher education sector. But it does bring me on to the fact, which I think um, Asha also mentioned, which is that we have a tremendous responsibility if we take on that educational job to support our students. And that, I think, is where we go from content dominating our institutions, if it does, to an activity, because our output, our outcomes, our goal and our aim is to give um, education opportunity to people who could not otherwise get it. And that student support has to be both subject-based, it has to be skills-based. We cannot assume our students have the skills that the elite students have in the selective institutions. And it has to be effective and personal 
We have to care about our students, and we have to put a goal of student success at the core of our enterprise. So I hope that helps you move your conversation on a little bit. I think I would like to combine what you said to what Asher initially posed, and I'm getting back to the MOOC and the blended issue, Tolly. If our students come into business education and open education through fractured pathways, I like that, how often do they leave as fractured human beings? Because we never were able to provide them. They drop out. They, they, just, they just cannot complete what the curricula, what we set out for them to do, Alan. So do we perpetuate inequality? Do we perpetuate their fracturedness? Or do we really play a healing role? Do we make a difference? Asha, would you like to sort of... The, we cannot provide content anymore, it's there, so that's what you propose. Alan brought to you the picture the fractured pathways through which our students enter higher education, specifically distance education. So what is our role? Do they leave us more fulfilled, um, less fractured people by the time they leave distance education, Ashwa? Well, I think uh, we've got to move beyond, you know, uh, what we said in the title that growing capacities to capabilities. Okay. And here I'm using the words uh, that Professor Amartya Sen has, uh, you know, developed the capability approach and Alan knows about it because he wrote in a paper, I don't know if it was published, I saw it in an unpublished version, of how people actually move from capacity to capability. Well, you, you, when you expand on that, what is the difference between from cap you capacity see to capability? Uh, from capa it's more like a difference of moving from outputs to outcomes. For example, if I have a degree, I've achieved an output. What am I going to do with it? And let me, uh, since we are in the host country, South Africa, quote a study uh, which a person called Walker did in 2006 with schoolgirls. Right. And she asked the schoolgirls that what is it that you want to learn, you know, what, what should learning lead to? And the secondary schoolgirl said three things. One is personal autonomy and independence of thought. They wanted that from learning, not just, you know, history and geography. They wanted to enter the world of work. And they wanted an, an identity and a voice which earned them respect. So they are no longer fractured, fractured human beings, okay. but they are people who are whole human beings. And is this what we are doing through distance learning or even through any kind of educational system? Why are we not moving people from capacity to capability? And I think this links very closely with what we are looking at in the sustainable development goals which the UN has adopted. We want inclusive quality lifelong education for all by 2030. And of course, that means leading, you know, so, uh, in fact, Call has adopted a new strategic plan and the strat line is learning for sustainable development. And by sustainable development, we mean a kind of inclusive and holistic approach, which means learning which leads to economic opportunities, learning which leads to social inclusion, and learning which leads to environmental sustainability. So I think if we are able to do those and develop, move from capacity to capability and provide learning, whether it's online, MOOC, OER, or whatever means we use of getting there, of providing sustainable development, then I think the global community will achieve those sustainable development goals by 2030. Okay, thanks, Asha. Tolly, I'm not, you're not rid of me yet. Um, you posed a question, I want to combine that to what Asha said. Um, Somehow the distance education institutions have missed out the opportunity for the massive open online courses. Somehow we have all the experience in the world to have gone there and we didn't for a number of reasons and maybe we can explore that. And Tolly, you said the differences between traditional higher education and distance education are disappearing or becoming porous. So what is our value contribution? <laughs> Yes. What do we add to the picture? Okay. Tolly? Th yeah. Thank you very much. What difference do we make? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I'll speak on based on the experiences of the African Council for Decent Education in this. We had discussions uh, since last year 
on what do we need to do in order to be able to, pro to add value to the utilization of MOOCs services. What we see here is that uh, it's important that uh, the open business learning institutions have to assist the world to make sure the issue of quality uh, of material delivered through the MOOCs movement must be of high quality. And uh, how is that done? It must be done on the basis of the needs that is there. And uh, what we have agreed, for example, there is a common need to make sure all the uh, lecturers are ICT literate. But to be able to get a good uh, lecturer who can guide learners well, uh, be it in residential mode or in distance mode, the lecturers themselves have to be very competent. And uh, we agreed on some basic skills that uh, a lecturer needs to have to, to, be, to be regarded as a, an, an ICT literate lecturer for the 21st century. Now, we have agreed as SED to uh, pilot a, a curriculum that was developed by one of our members, adopted by different institutions, and now the institutions will test it as an OER for a short while with view to uh, developing an SED uh, MOOCs of a quality MOOC uh, in a few years uh, down the road. The idea here is that uh, the need is there, but uh, the way in which you exploit the MOOCs uh, approach, you do it in a manner which is more guided and you produce uh, quality uh, information. And I think it's quite clear that uh, the open distance learning institutions uh, have, uh, those which are in Africa, have been able to produce content that is used beyond their own borders. I give examples of the science and the, and, and the mathematics materials that were produced by 12 African universities uh, guided by the African Virtual University, which is uh, indeed, materials these are available online, but to our surprise, they are used more by the people living in the US and South America more than the Africans. And we ask ourselves, why are the Africans failing to access their own materials? Uh, other examples which are there that Africa uh, African ODL institutions are producing content that is valuable, include uh, the delivery of programs which uh, are offered to students from all over Africa, uh, all over the world except South America. This is an example of the postgraduate diploma in curriculum development and, and design, which is offered joint by the Open University of Tanzania, but uh, collaboratively with UNESCO and Tanzania Institute for Education. So if you can get students coming from different parts of the world, it means we, we have to be more proactive in generating content, which is uh, acceptable, and we get more students who would be accessing material from beyond the world. So the aspect of uh, partnership and collaboration, to me, seems to be a very major aspect which will guarantee quality delivery. Final comment I want to make on the point raised by Asha. This is now a problem of all uh, African governments, at least. The, the employers, be them public or private, are complaining that we are producing graduates, yes, but the graduates that we produce don't seem to fit in the world of work. Now, right now, I think we are very busy in Africa, working very hard to try and bring the, the providers very close to discuss with the employers to, to agree on the way forward. One big problem which is there is that not many African governments have been able to produce a, a national skills development program. We thought when we liberalize the industry, it meant the government doesn't need to guide the country with regard to skills development. It's not true. We see that this is now becoming very critical. And I think the, the increasing proportion of youth who are now found in our countries with bigger proportion of youth forming a bigger part of the workforce, we require that uh, the universities uh, that are delivering the graduates have to work more closely with the potential employers than we have been doing before. Otherwise, we are doomed to have big problems with the youth who are demanding their fair share of national development. Thanks, Tori. I, I see Harold Yash uh, tweeted something that the curriculum is a broadcast model. We broadcast existing values. And you spoke about uh, the need for ICT literacy. And I want to combine it to what Tracy said. Is there not a need for an inequality literacy in our curricula? Or do our stakeholders and our employers dictate what we teach? Can I recap? <laughs> we, we think if our students are ICT literate, 
and if they are employable, that would sort of make all the difference. And trying to get back to what Tracy said, is there not a need that our curricula should it should empower our students to be inequality literate? And and what are the forces that make them unequal in this increasingly unequal world? Who would like to respond to that? Oh. Alan. Uh, le 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 let me come back to that, Paul. Let me just briefly recap on what I think we add to the scene, and then I'll come on yes, to the please. issue of curriculum. Yeah. So I think what we add in our institutions that are engaged with open distance and e-learning and in our professional community are two things, and there's something which is missing, which or not adequately there. So the two things, firstly, are, first of all, I believe there is a passion for inclusion. We have S we have a record, a record of which we can be proud of seeking to provide educational opportunity for, for those who have been excluded, the people who come the harder way into educational opportunity. That we can be proud of. That's a values thing which I think you'll find across most of our institutions and our community, the colleagues who are sitting here. And because we are reaching new kinds of audiences, new kinds of students, we also have a passion for learning, teaching and student support. We've had to really think about this. And I think we have pioneered this for the education sector as a whole. 50 years ago in the UK, in universities, people didn't talk about learning and teaching. It was just assumed if you had a PhD in chemistry, you knew how to teach. What was the problem? We have learned and we have taught others to think about learning, teaching and student support. But I don't think we have thought enough about curriculum. And I think this agenda comes in with the agenda for SEN, which Asha has raised, and the agenda for sustainable development goals, which, which, which lie behind the, the word sustainable in our conference theme. Um, perhaps we've been a little afraid of it, but Sen's core idea, which Asha has mentioned, was that people should, through a development process, gain the freedom to choose. That development was not a top-down idea that we did to people in poorer contexts, but we gave people the capability to be free to choose. And we need to think about why we have not been at the forefront of innovation about curriculum, about program planning. Uh, how are we going to help people manage their livelihoods more effectively? How are we going to help them manage a process of change? How are we going to make them, and the, S, the Sustainable Development Goals make this an explicit target, how are we going to make them educated and to understand sustainability? Because actually, the human race on this planet depends on okay. us understanding sustainability. So I do agree with our colleague Harold Lalship that, sustain that um, curriculum and program planning, we have to go back and we have to think about how we create that for the next 15 years for the Sustainable Development Goals. I like that, but I'm concerned there's a discourse of excellence. I also picked that up on the, on the Twitter stream. There's this notion that distance education institutions must sort of compete with Harvard, where Tracy is, and with Virginia Tech, and with all those big... So we have a specific notion of excellence. And most of the excellence discourses are determined by research-intensive universities and the whole notion of rankings. So how do we compete with that agenda in a world where excellence and rankings are determined by people with a specific view and most probably not really caring about the sustainable development goals, Asher? <laughs> are we in different markets? Should we just let them go and we do something else, Asher? You know, I think the fundamental thing is for any learning, it should lead, to, uh, as Alan said, you know, the freedom to make choices, which leads to empowerment. We are not simply preparing people for the market. I mean, that's one dimension. Can, the can livelihoods. you just repeat that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we are not just preparing people for livelihoods opportunities. I mean, obviously, employment and entrepreneurship is very valuable okay. for economic mm -hmm. empowerment. But I think we are moving beyond that to social empowerment of people, you know, to have a kind of sense of agency as human beings, as good citizens, as people who have power within their households, within their communities, within their spheres. And in fact, we've developed an empowerment index because we really work with uh, grassroots communities. And these are illiterate women, you know, f lifelong learning for farmers is one of our projects where for every dollar that is invested, nine dollars worth of assets have been generated. There are illiterate people who have learned goat rearing, uh, milk production, dairy farming, and so on. And they've actually got first economic empowerment and then social empowerment. Now they are better considered 
within the societies. And we've also developed an empowerment index to actually measure that. But I think another interesting debate which is coming out in relation to the curriculum that you mentioned is that in different phases of society, I mean, like, for example, in the earlier part of the 20th century, it was an industrial age where people needed, you know, kind of industrial workers. And that's when women were most disadvantaged. Latter half, we became more knowledge worker oriented. And now, as we move into the 21st century, I think from the knowledge workers, there's going to be yet another transition to relationship workers. Now, within a distance and open learning context, how do we actually create those values and those team spirits, the abilities to collaborate? Uh, Tolly talked about collaboration, and which is going to be key. How are we going to actually mold the curriculum to integrate both cognitive and non-cognitive skills? Thank you. I, I want to get back to something that Professor Makanya said, and, and I just question mark that. Back to the curriculum, Alan. What is the role of distance education in nation building? <laughs> um, while distance goes across borders, and we claim the space you can study anywhere, anytime, any place, for whatever reason, the freedom to choose, there's a specific expectation possibly from government as a funder, as a role player, that our curricula should assist in nation building, question mark. <laughs> How does that play out, Tolly? Or have we, is nation building and distance education almost a contradiction in terms? Am I, maybe I'm from another planet. <laughs> but uh, Tolly, would you like to respond? Thank you very much. Um, I think there, there are two ways in which one would see the role of um, open distance learning institution in nation building. One, I think as I, I made very clear that uh, the open distance learning institutions will take up a much bigger role in educating the community in general terms. So the role of being able to stress the importance of uh, some ethical behavior and values to the, to the society in the future is becoming, uh, uh, it's demanded by the society. And, and therefore, the open distance learning institutions are well placed if they work well with the, you know, with the governments and pub private institutions to be able to utilize the existing infrastructure to deliver uh, such education. I, I give two, two simple examples, one from South Africa, one from Tanzania. I think we saw the issue of the xenophobic attack uh, uh, in South Africa, uh, I think for the second time uh, sometime uh, uh, early in the year. And uh, some of us fail, were asking ourselves uh, to what extent did the South African institutions, now it's only universities, all institutions, to what extent did the South African ins educational institutions participate in educating the general society as well as the youth, in particular the youth, uh, on the history of how this country became independent. If that role had been played very well, linked between now the educational institutions and the government, if that role had been played well, maybe, uh, the level of education and knowledge of uh, the youth who were involved in these attacks may have been a bit different. And I'm saying it because uh, 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 Tanzania was very much involved in the liberation struggles. People back in Tanzania and other countries were wondering how could uh, someone who helped to liberate this nation be attacked by the South Africans. So there is a problem, but the, the, the educational institutions have a role to play there. Come back to the issue of ethics, this one is not only for one country. All African countries, the youth are looking at how the elders are behaving now. And it, the, the elders have to assist the youth uh, to see that there is a need for them to uh, follow some ethical principles in day-to-day -day life. And it, how can that be done? It can only be done if there is a program that is delivered through the Open Distance Learning Institution to support in this type of uh, interventions in the future. And, and, and the final one, which I think um, is, is a tested one, the, the new challenges that have come from the UN uh, develop, uh, Service Development Goals require that no one is left out. The open distance learning institutions have a very rare opportunity now to assist to train uh, all the, the, the citizens of different countries who have special needs 
to be included in the education. And I'm saying this because uh, the Open University of Tanzania did participate recently in some programs of training people uh, with, uh, who, are, have, uh, who are blind and people who, cannot, uh, who are deaf. They, they were trained in ICT literacy, followed by hands-on experience in repairing computers and mobile phones. It made a difference. Those, those people who left that course program, if they are properly supported where they go, they, they, they would be able to support themselves, but they will also uh, feel that the society is not leaving them out. So I'm looking at that element of inclusiveness. That is one example in which how ODL institutions can participate in uh, not leaving anyone out of the development. That to me would also help uh, 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 national bonding in any case. Uh, Tori, uh, the, you use the notion of the curriculum as the stories the elders tell to the youth, if I can paraphrase you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we define the curriculum as the stories we tell our children, why would the elders tell a different story that doesn't ensconce and protect their rights and patriarchy and gender inequality and the current as is? Do you know, where, do you see where I'm getting at? If the curriculum is always in service of current power relations and protecting the current power regimes and the current knowledge structures, how do we think different of a, of, a, of, a, of a curriculum that provokes, that probe, Alan? Do you think we have a space in our regulatory environments that, that our curricula can really be different? Uh, Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, said the issue is not literacy, but we should teach our students to read the world. And I'm getting back to Tracy. If, if that is what the curriculum is, they should have the ability to read the world and not only retell the stories the elders told them. <laughs> what should change in our curricula? Alan, <coughs> Asher, who would like to go? Well, let, 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 me, let me respond, thank you, Asher, by saying that um, we have a tradition which is challenged and it's challenged within our world of open distance and e-learning, which we should talk about. We have a tradition of our post-secondary institutions being places for critical thought. And you can unpack this issue. I, I often reflect on a question asked by a French politician in the recent past, Lionel Jospin, and he asked, are we seeking to develop a market society or a society with a market? Wow. And I hope we have a vision for our programs of study, as well as the way in which we support students, and actually the two are interlinked, um, which is a humanistic vision. And we've had, as Tressie um, referred to in her keynote this morning, we have had in the recent past but not only in the USA, we have had some of the online for-profit colleges which seek a very reduced version, offer a very reduced version of education to their students, which is simply for a market society. Actually, too often they fail their students, the students take on huge loans for courses which they're not um, suitable, and the benefits from those courses aren't as described, they don't get them even the livelihood outcomes that they want. So I think we must um, struggle within ODEL, within our community, to make sure in my view, if this doesn't sound too preachy, Paul, that we retain a humanistic vision for a society with a market as opposed to a market with a society. But may I just finish by mm -hmm. saying that I think we must be careful about the boundaries we draw around ourselves as a community in open distance and e-learning. Because, of course, there are other conferences taking place around the world which are now well into our, the secret garden that we regarded as ours for so many wow. years. And that world, they would describe themselves as people interested in technology-enhanced learning because technology isn't only our um, prerogative now, as we thought it was for so long in distance and e-learning, it's on the campuses now. And as Tolly has referred to, MOOCs were pioneered by intensive research-based campus universities, not from our world. Yeah. So I think we need to look very carefully at our boundaries because I think we could build some very fruitful relationships also more broadly with the world of technology enhanced learning uh, as well as the world of distance, open and e-learning. Would you like to respond, Asha, or can I take the conversation one level further? Take it one level further. I, just I have permission to take it further. Oh. <laughs> you said, and I'm glad I'm with you, you said we should move, where did I make the note, from, from knowledge workers to relationship workers. All our learning increasingly takes place behind the firewall of a learning management system. 
how does that it may be technology enhanced but is it very poor in relationship enhanced so if if we want to move from knowledge workers to relationship workers and all the relationships they ha can have takes place be be behind the firewall what should change what role does the lms all our institutions many of our institutions face a question how do we utilize the learning management system in a learning way uh, in a, in, a, in a, as a platform for learning and not as a management tool so if we want relationship workers what role does the lms play in that asha or should we think different about the role of the learning management system you know the learning management system is only a tool today it's a learning management system tomorrow it'll be something else so these are things which are changing very fast with advances in technology but if we are looking for building relationship workers collaborators team players i think one of the fundamentals of that is empathy and this is not something i'm saying this is uh, jeff colvin's recent book which talks about you know the need to create empathy and i want to sort of come back to the point which alan was making that you know we've in a way had kind of different demarcations distance learning institutions research institutions teaching institutions and so on i think those boundaries are blurring and the second thing is that we've always thought that you know universities are these ivory towers of learning where research and other things happen and we are not bothered much about you know the world around us except you know we have a little element of extension with teaching and research which we sometimes bother about and sometimes completely ignore so that is one area i mean national development is one area where we've never really thought that it's our business let the politicians and the planners and the policy makers do that but i think because it's going to be extremely difficult now for the governments to have resources and the minister said that and in fact philip altsback talked about you know uh, one chinese research university costing 700 million dollars to set up with an annual recurring cost of 400 million every year so obviously brick and mortar institutions are not going to be uh, possible or even a possibility for many people in developing countries so how can we utilize our own expertise of the last 50 years you know where we've really sort of this distance learning has escalated and get into national development and what does national development mean things like poverty eradication gender equality and equity issues climate change these are all you know of paramount importance to governments national governments as well as to the international global community so how can we deploy distance learning or e-learning call it what you will i mean to mm -hmm. sort of further these objectives then i think we'll have really played a role and perhaps even a leadership role in this aspect i see tracy has tweeted that the trickle down effect has no empirical evidence okay. if we empower a few more it will somehow trickle down <laughs> um, where does that leave distance education Alan's if we cannot expect that if we can empower a few more just save a few more it will eventually trickle down I have a gut feeling that we should know also what distance education cannot do mm. <laughs> I, I, I think it's the one takeaway that I take from Chrissy is that possibly distance education can be seen as trying to save the world and we cannot um, so it's a thin line to say to think what we can do and what we can't do and that that impacts on our capability and our sense of agency would you like to would anyone like to respond what cannot this and what what cannot this is education do what can't we do Tolly, would you like yeah. to take it thank you I I'm a strong believer in uh, uh, not putting any any not closing any doors to this education I think what is critical here is that um, for distance education institutions to participate uh, effectively in uh, contributing uh, to national development, the, 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 the different uh, faculties that are involved in professional fields have to work very closely with the industry. And I think it's quite clear that uh, there are quite a number of efforts that have been made in improving delivery of education but uh, on uh, the other hand, the, co the complaints about the employers 
on the unemployability or inability to innovate uh, of our graduates means that uh, the, the open distance learning universities have no way except to have to work in the future more closely with the industry. And, and uh, I'm looking at uh, changes, uh, for example, in setting up assignments. Instead of the universities setting up uh, theoretical assignments, now here is the time where the lecturers have to be encouraged to set up assignments that follow real problems in the field so that uh, the people who are involved in uh, uh, those assignments, they, they are forced to actually interact with the society during the course of uh, solving those assignments. We have seen some courses that are very popular. Uh, the Open University of Tanzania runs a, course, a master's degree in community economic development, which involves uh, uh, the, the students uh, being given a real problem in the society and part of the, the, the condition for graduation is that at the end of the studies, they have to show that there has been major progress uh, that has taken place in that particular problem, assisted by the students. So if we start having more of these type of assignments, uh, we must design them closely with the industry. It will assist you know, us to be able to perform well in the professional fields. So all I'm saying is that it's not good to draw a line to say open distance learning institutions should only teach this this type of disciplines. Rather, the universities have to plan their programs uh, more closely with the industry. And if this is done, I think the, 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 the graduates who will leave the universities can be model examples. We have seen, for example, in, uh, in Tanzania, the law graduates who come from the Open University of Tanzania. When they do their annual registration of lawyers uh, from time to time, the top performers in their interview process are always students from the ODL system because they are able to study and use the skills uh, while others uh, start using the skills after they've finished with the studies. So my view is, uh, is, uh, is on the contrary. We, 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 as universities, we must take more seriously the guidance that comes from industry in our but, but that's scary, Tolly. That's scary. If industry aims to make money, that's a very generalized, broad claim. If, if that is the captains of industry, their aim is to be sustainable in the sense of profitable. If a higher education institution designs a curricula that supports sustainability, Alan, or that quench, questions capitalism as the only alternative to a more equal and a more just world, if industry doesn't want that type of curricula, where does that leave this as education? Where does that leave our relationship with the captains of industry, whatever gender they are? At my home institution, the College of Economic and Management Sciences have now included a signature module, a module that all students must take in order to graduate. And the, the title of the, the, the module is Greed and Sustainability. And a huge number of academics in the college were very uncomfortable with, that, with the juxtaposition of greed and sustainability, especially in the College of Economic and Management Sciences. And, not to s and I don't even want to say what the employers said of that title. How much space do higher education institution, business education have, has to, to, to really propose an alternative curricula that is passionate about sustainability? Alan, and, 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 the, and Earth, Mother Earth. Well, it's, it's, it's a contest. Um, it's a contest. It's always a contest. We live, we all of us live and work in societies with particular structures, economic structures, ideological structures, and we can't pretend they don't exist. They do exist. But they do give us, in most cases, in many cases, space to help change. And that's, I think, all I would argue open distance and e-learning can do. We exploit the space we have to make change. So I don't want the best to be the enemy of the good, uh, if you're familiar with that proverb. My university, the Open University UK, if you'll allow me to say, has changed over the last 45 years what higher education looks like. We have changed how people think of graduates. Our graduates look like regular, ordinary people. They are not out of the elite, which they were almost entirely 45 years ago. We have changed what higher education looks like. We have democratized university study. Uh, we've allowed people in who are adults. That wasn't thought of as 
a sensible idea, as it wasn't thought of as possible. We have worried about how we teach and support students. We've invented curriculum which serves new kinds of students. Um, let me, may I just take a moment to tell you about some curriculum innovation because I think it's relevant Please. to our point. When I was responsible for curriculum in my university, I was much involved with three particular new programs and I approached these new programs with, Tressie might be pleased to know, sociological insight as best as I could muster it. Um, because I looked for who might want to study with the Open University who wasn't doing it now. And so I got faculty to support programs, first of all, in sport, because sport doesn't come out of high culture, it comes out of a much ge more generalized culture. People are enthusiastic about sport from backgrounds where their families have not gone to university. We introduced a program in retail management, because retail is a huge industrial sector, with people are low paid, low qualified, but there are intelligent and energetic people, of course, working in that sector. If you say to them, come and study history or chemistry, they say, why? You say, come and study retail, they say, that's interesting, that's what I work in, I might do that. Uh, and we also studied, introduced programs for early years workers. We had a huge expansion of early years, uh, 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 an occupational group, 98% women, um, low paid, low qualified. These were able and energetic people who wanted to study. And again, it was their occupational center that to them looked an attractive uh, subject area to study. So I think we need to readdress curriculum priorities to fit with our mission of access. And I think that is possible. I hope that helps you uh, move your conversation. Asher, would point. you like to join this interaction that Tolly started? <laughs> you know, I'd like to say that um, open and distance learning, let's not look at it only in the context of higher education. Uh, ex very important. Thank you uh, for and that. And I'll give you two very concrete examples to prove that. There's a young woman from Bangladesh. She's 22 years old. She, she left school when she was 12. She got married. She has three children who ask her to help with the homework. She can't because she doesn't know anything anymore. So she's gone back to open schooling, joined class six. And now after two years, she's actually able to help her children with homework. I mean, here is a woman who's actually empowered because of the opportunity which distance learning provided her. The second is uh, the question of, you know, grassroots workers, goat herders. And here is sustainable development at its best. Call doesn't give any money to anybody. It just catalyzes partnerships with banks, financial institutions, with expert institutions like agriculture colleges, and with the community and the market. The community decides what it wants to learn. They decided on goat herding. Experts taught them how to do it well. And the financial institutions gave them loans, and 95% of those loans are paid back. So nobody is actually, wow. you know, a donor or a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of, you know, engagement of all kinds of stakeholders in which it's a win-win situation for everybody. And because the goats eat the leaves of those bushes around the village, one of the elements of that program is that these women have to actually plant so many uh, extra bushes to make up for the kind of deficit which the goats, goats are ca causing. So you what, know, what are the men doing? What are, why are the men not planting <laughs> the trees? You know, the men have jobs <laughs> outside the village. They're not there. No, sorry, Asha, I couldn't <laughs> let that one go. No, but good one. <laughs> um, we have five minutes left. Um, one of the first things that uh, Tian said this morning was, the need for collaboration has never been greater. <coughs> the reality of collaboration has never been smaller. <laughs> Why? If, if we face all these challenges and if the need for collaboration is so big, why don't distance education institutions, I don't want to talk organizations, I don't want to hear FCDE and DPTT and all that. Collaborations on the ground, faculty, in academics engaging. Why don't we collaborate more, Asha, from your side? You have such a wide experience. Or is collaboration sort of sedimented in these organiza new organizational structures? Let's have a, a new organization with executive, and let's have an organization with an executive that can have conferences as spectacular as this. How do we collaborate more? You know, any collaboration or partnership is based on shared values and shared objectives. Thank you. And th those are fundamental to any kind of partnership which is happening. I mean, of course, it's a kind of cliche to say that, yes, we've grown in cultures, you know, where competition rather than collaboration <coughs> was the norm. 
and we had to excel to get ahead. But I mean, now to change from that to this, it's got to be a win-win for everybody. It's got to be on shared values. And it's also got to be fundamentally on people that you like working with. So if you've got all those elements, you're off to a good start. And I hope this is going to provide that opportunity. One yeah. final question. If there's one word you can re could remove from our strategic plans, Tolly, Alan, Asha. Uh, I, if I have to count the number of times innovation, excellence, um, effective uh, quality, all those words creep uh, into our policies and our organizational plans for the next 50 years, 100 years. What word would you remove and what would you replace it with? <laughs> I've, I've got one for you. Which Alan, which, which, which word I'd would you take away and what word would you replace it with? I'd take away the word top. I've read too many strategic plans which say we will be the top this or the top that. Can we applaud him? <laughs> <laughs> it, seems to me, it seems to me to speak to arrogance and it defeats the spirit of collaboration and replaces it with competition. Wow, wow. Uh, I <laughs> there, there's an amen from that side. <laughs> Asher, is there one word that you would like to remove from this, this rhetoric that we produce in all the documents? You know, I think uh, all these documents are now looking at other documents and then writing their own. Um, so uh, there's a lot of repetition <laughs> of words which don't really mean, because many open universities, if you look at their mission statements, one of the top mission statements is research. We want to be the leaders in research. And that's the last thing that figures on anybody's agenda within open universities, you know, for various reasons, and all of them justifiable. So that's the one. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Tolly, and yes. this is not my last question, but yeah. anyway, Tolly, okay. so what word would you remove? For me, rather than try to remove uh, any of the words, I, I just want to send a caution. I think the coming in of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals requires that um, every, if an, an open and distance learning university does not have a unit or department dealing with lifelong learning, it is now, That's high, another word. It's now, okay. now high time that every university must start that. And I feel these lifelong learning requirements would uh, sometimes force our institutions to collaborate with other institutions if they find there is a, a, a local need for some skills and they have no expertise, then they will be forced to collaborate with other institutions. And uh, this, I think, would address uh, uh, the development goals for sustained um, in the future. My last question, uh, colleagues, to the panel is I want to get to an issue Tracy raised. If access does not equal justice, if providing access does not necessarily correlate to justice or l less inequality, what should change? Any one of you would like to have final word? Inclusive I know it's a very, very difficult inclusive access. I go for inclusive access. Tolly, Asha, from your side? Inclusive access is the key word. Inclusive access, okay. Well, involving a large number of stakeholders, you know, that would be the thing, to involve all kinds of stakeholders, especially the ones who are the most remote, the most marginalized, the most disadvantaged. Okay. Alan, from your side, if we want to change that, that access does not necessarily equal more just worlds, mm. what should change? We need to think more deeply what open means. Open okay. is not enough. Open is, um, I couldn't have asked for a better ending to this, colleagues. Can I ask us for a, a round of applause? <laughs>